Hey everyone, welcome to Garden Fork Radio. I'm your host, Eric Rochow. If this is your first time, thanks for checking us out. It's uh, kind of the world of Eric, which is what I call eclectic DIY. It's usually me and some of my friends, guest hosts, well, guests, we haven't had any guest hosts yet, um, talking about just kind of a range of subjects. Today you have me as a solo show, and one of my kind of recurring themes is done is better than perfect, and the other one is embrace failure. And in the New York Times, there was a guest uh, opinion page, editor- is it an uh, editorial? It's a personal essay uh, in the sporting section by an author named Karen Rinaldi, and I'll link to this in the show notes. But uh, it kind of rang th- true for me, and I thought I would read it to you. It's a little, it's not super short, but uh, the title is called It's Great to Suck at Something. And I was going to read it to you and then talk about a couple other things today. All right, so please enjoy your ride to work or wherever you are, and uh, let me know what you think about this. Here we go. I'm going to try and read from a web page. Ready? Over the past 15 years, surfing has become kind of an obsession for me. I surf eight months a year. I travel to surf destinations for family vacations and seek forgiving waves in the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. I've spent thousands of dollars on boards of all sizes and shapes. And yet, I suck at it. In the sport of Hawaiian kings, I'm a jester. In surfing parlance, a kook, I fall and flail. I get hit on the head by my own board. I run out of breath when held down by a four-foot wave. I wimp out when the waves get overhead and I paddle back to shore. When I do catch a wave, I'm rarely graceful. On those rare occasions when I do manage a decent drop, turn, and trim, I usually blow it by celebrating with a fist pump or a hoot. Once, I actually cried tears of joy over what any observer would have thought a so-so performance on so-so waves. Yes, I was moved to tears by mediocrity. So why continue? Why pursue something I'll never be good at? Because it's great to suck at something. When people hear that I surf, I get a knowing nod of awesomeness from the terra firma bound. I know what they're picturing me. I know what they're picturing. Me on a thruster, carving up and down a wave face until I casually kick out the back to paddle out to line up for another. The truth is that most surfers don't come close to what we see in the highlight videos. But pretty's not the point. The point is the patience and perseverance it requires to get back on the board and try again. After a surf instructor pushed me into my first wave, it took me five years to catch one on my own. When I do catch a wave and feel the glide, I'll hold on to that feeling for hours, days, or even weeks. I'm hooked on the pursuit of those, I'm hooked on the pursuit of those moments, however elusive they may be. But it's not the momentary high that sustained me. In the process of trying to attain a few moments of bliss, I experienced something else. Patience and humility, definitely, but also freedom. Freedom to pursue the the futile. And the freedom to suck without caring is revelatory. My friend Andy Martin is a Cambridge don of French literature. He has surfed all over the world. But about his status as a surfer, he tells me, I'm called a surfer only at Cambridge. In his mind, he sucks, but he's okay with that. That's being okay. Okay, that being okay is the humility that comes only with sucking and persevering. The notion of sucking at something flies in the face of the overhyped notion of perfectionism. The lie of perfectionism goes something like this. If I fail, it's only because I seek perfection. Or, I can never finish anything because I'm a perfectionist. Since the perfectionist will settle for nothing less, she is left with nothing. Self-knowledge here is the key. No one ever tells you how much you suck at something. Unless you have a mean boss, an abusive parent, or a malicious friend, most people are happy to help us maintain the delusion that our efforts are not in vain. No, we cannot count on people around us to let us know how much we suck. It is far more acceptable to compliment than to criticize, since the onus is on us as individuals to admit to ourselves how much it would suck at something, and then we do it anyway. Oh, 
So the onus is on us as individuals to admit to ourselves how much we suck at something and then do it anyway. By taking off the pressure of having to excel or master an activity, we allow ourselves to live in the moment. You might think this sounds simple enough, but living in the present is also something most of us suck at. Think about how focused you become when you're presented with something totally new to accomplish. Now, what happens when that task is no longer new, but still taps into an intense focus because we haven't yet mastered it? You're a novice, an amateur, a kook. You suck at it. Some might think your persistence moronic. I like to think of it as a meditative, I like to think of it as meditative and full of promise. In the words of the Zen teacher Shunru Suzuki, in the beginner's mind there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are few. When I surf, I live in the possibility. Or as the great father of surfing, Duke Kahanamoku wisely advised, be shape, be patient. Wave come. Wave always come. But then, when's that going to happen? As my friend Michael Scott Moore wrote in his book, Sweetness and Blood, when a surfer takes off on a wave, there are two possible results. Fairly predictably for me, the outcome is an epic fail. Yet I remain hopeful that this time will be better than the last. Maybe sucking at something where the stakes are low can lead us to a better place. Maybe it could be a kind of medicine for the epidemic cocksureness in our culture. Seeing ourselves repeatedly doing something we suck at, no matter how trivial, might make us a bit more sympathetic to how hard so many things really are. Trying to navigate health issues, listening to our neighbors, improving the economy, or mitigating relations with hostile nations. By exposing ourselves to the experience of trying and failing, we might develop more empathy. If we succeed in shifting from snap judgments to patience, maybe we could be a little more helpful to one another and a whole lot more understanding. If we accept our failures and perceive, okay, if we accept our failures and persevere nonetheless, we might provide a respite from the imperative to succeed and instead find acceptance in trying. Failing is okay. Better still, isn't it a relief? There'll always be another chance and another one after that. Trust me, be patient. Waves come, waves always come. That was by Karen Rinaldi in the sporting section of the New York Times. It's under the opinion pages. Uh, if you just type in surfing in the New York Times, it might show up. But I'll uh, link to it in the show notes here. And I, you know, I am not good at a lot of things. And I kind of like to embrace that. And it also kind of goes toward the um, idea of the meditation that I've started recently and I've become better at. But I still suck at it. Um, if you're thinking about trying it and you think, oh, I can't clear my mind. Well, just go with the idea that you're not going to clear your mind. But what you can do is that stuff that comes into your mind, you can just let it go. And that's kind of the beauty of it is, yeah, it's going to pop into your head. But yeah, just let it go. So there you go. There's Eric's deep thought for the day. Let me know what you think. It's radio at gardenfork.tv. I've been uh, kind of doing a deep dive on the podcast, 99% Invisible. Uh, Roman Mars is, uh, he's, it just kind of, it's brilliant. I'm sure it takes an, a lot more work. It just sounds very fluid. And I realized recently that um, they also have a website that they post other interesting articles on. It's kind of like Garden Fork, but they do it better because <laughs> I suck at it. <laughs> Um, but I keep doing it. Uh, there was a thing about making electric meters spin backwards. That was their podcast. And then there's a, actually a more in-depth article on their site. But in addition to a weekly podcast, they have at least two articles on the site, which are kind of design oriented, but more, I think kind of the, the it's it uh, maybe the, the, the building of the world and neat stuff in it. Uh, recently, they talked about a company in Australia 
that has made a classic clothesline, backyard clothesline dryer hanger rig that has been in almost every Australian backyard since uh, the 1930s, maybe. Um, but who, who knew about that, you know? It's kind of along the lines of um, stuff that you will find interesting. If you're a DIY kind of geeker kind of person, I think you'll enjoy a lot of it. And the website, if you just type into a search engine, 99 invisible, it'll show up. But it is 99%, okay, 99, two numerals, 99percentinvisible.org. And if you click on the articles heading, you'll get all the articles. It, the, it, has, it has podcast episodes, articles, and of course a donate button, <laughs> much like Garden Fork. Nice segue into, um, if you're thinking about maybe supporting Garden Fork, there's a couple different ways you can do that. One is to use our Amazon link. Uh, if you just type into your browser, gardenfork.tv slash Amazon, that will take you directly to Amazon with a tag telling Amazon that you came from Garden Fork. And if you do your shopping, buy, add something to your shopping cart and complete the shopping, uh, we get a small finder's fee for that. If you already have a bunch of stuff in your cart and then you use the Garden Fork Amazon link, I'm not sure if we get a finder's fee for that or not. I've read conflicting things about that. So if you want to start fresh, write down all the stuff you want <laughs> and then use the Garden Fork link, throw it all in your cart and check out and uh, then we would be good to go. That uh, actually helps a lot. The other way is to become a patron on our Patreon page. It's kind of like a PBS model, you know, where you're a monthly supporter of Garden Fork. And my suggest is a $3 a month, which is $36 a year, which is kind of like a magazine subscription. So there you go. I have a sink in the house that clogs more often than I would like. Actually, I have two sinks in the two bathrooms that do the same thing, thinking about it. And I still suck at fixing the drain because I immediately thought, I have one of these, it's called a zip, is it called a zip string? Of course, I have a video about it. It's a long, flexible plastic rod with little barbs on it. And you push it, you don't have to take the sink apart. You basically slip this thing under the plunger in your bathroom sink and you can scroll it around and it has little barbs on it and it can yank out like a big hair clog. And so I, uh, my sink was clogged and I did that and I'm like, okay, that's not the problem. And I know that this zip tool goes all the way down into the trap so I could pull out any debris that's stuck in the trap. So I'm like, okay, the clog is where the trap goes into the wall because there is a reducer there. It's a bathroom sinks are typically inch and a quarter diameter and the drain pipe in the wall is inch and a half. It's a PVC and it mates to the stainless steel of the trap. So I take this apart and I put the zipper tool in there and I pulled out a little bit of a clog, but I'm like, this is not enough to completely block the drain and it takes forever to drain. So I got my snake out. I have one of those auger snakes that you can attach a drill onto, which is a brilliant tool to buy. Um, that will save you several calls with the plumber, by the way. And, um, that didn't really, it pulled out a little debris, but I'm like, that. this is not, you know. So I put the whole thing together. I put the trap back on and screwed it all back together again. And sure enough, the drain clogged up right away. And I'm like, what's going on here? So I took the plun the stopper, is it called a plunger or a stopper, out. And there's a rod that basically goes perpendicular to the, it's called the tailpipe. It's the pipe that comes out of the bottom of your sink. And that rod pushes the stopper up and down to clog up your sink so you could fill it if you want to wash your face and hands or wash some clothing or something, I guess. And I took the rod out and I pulled the plunger out. And the bottom of the plunger has, uh, because it's a, it's a metal plunger, it has these little fins on the side to give it some structure so it can actually move up and down and not break. And that was all congealed soap and some hair and probably toothpaste 
Um, and I'm like, oh, here's our problem. <laughs> so I clean that all off and it was a lot. And the little, my little zipper tool would, would not, pull this stuff off because it's kind of stuck under the plunger. I'm writing a post about it on the site and um, I'll refer to that here. So again, I'm thinking, do we even need, need a stopper in our bathroom sink? I mean, do, so I checked with the boss and I'm like, do we ever fill up the sink for any reason? And we really don't. Um, we have a modern day washing machine, so we don't usually wash, we don't wash stuff in the sink. Uh, in the kitchen sink, I don't think we ever use the, the stopper in the kitchen sink either, the plug thing. So here's my thinking, is to switch out the tailpiece of the bathroom sinks to a tailpiece that just has a grate across, well, the top of the pipe, but the bottom of the sink, you know, where there's the sink goes into the bottom and there's usually a stainless steel rim where the tailpipe begins, the drain pipe begins. And you can either get a, you can get a little screen that just drops in there and is held by gravity, or you can get screens that kind of like in the bottom of a shower that screw in or held in with a little screw. And that allows you, if the thing gets gunked up, you can just clean it off and throw that gunked up stuff in the trash or in your compost, which would be even better. Soap is compostable, compostable, by the way. And that would save you some time and having to take apart this thing. And if you're not handy, that would also save you uh, having to call a plumber or a friend or something. And as I think about more about aging in place, I'm thinking to make things easier and fixing stuff in a big way so it won't ever break again. And that was my thought on that. So let me know what you guys think. Radio at gardenfork.tv. Putting a screen across the bottom of the bathroom sink instead of the the plunger stopper thing. Do you ever use your sink for something? I don't know. Maybe that's more than I need to know. <laughs> Out in the garden, it's still pretty cool. We had warm days and then cool days, warm days, cool days. But I've had a lot of success so far with sugar snap peas. And here's what I did this year. There's there's a lot of articles that are like, you can plant sugar snow peas in snow. And maybe you can, but I've found that the soil needs to be a little warm for them to germinate. And I put them in my raised beds, which warm up faster than, you know, in-ground uh, garden beds, I found. But what I also did was I went to my local uh, plant nursery slash uh, farm slash farmer's market. And I bought some sugar snap pea plants that they had started, you know, a couple months, well, at least a month before. And they were about six inches tall in those little transplant packs. And I've read where people swear that sugar snap peas are not transplantable. Well, they are, and they're going really well. Uh, they're about a foot tall now. So what I did at the ends of, I have four foot by 12 foot raised beds. Um, they're on the side or in the videos. I'll, I'll link to some of them in the show notes here. You can take a look. And I put them at the four foot ends and I build these really simple trellises. Again, all this kind of thing is documented on our site and boom, they just start growing. So I've got the, the ones that I direct sowed are about four inches tall. And the ones I bought as transplants are about a foot tall. And we love sugar snap peas. They rarely make it into the kitchen, actually. Uh, we just eat them off the vine. And unfortunately, somebody has taught the Labradors how to eat sugar snap peas. Um, so they do, <laughs> which is fine. You know, it keeps them healthy. But uh, I'm just a little curious if you guys got any secrets about that. There is a particular variety. It's called the super sugar snap peas which I plant every year, but I also planted some other sugar snap pea varieties that I got from Fedco this year. One of them is grows much shorter, so I'd be interested to see about that one. And I'm blanking on the names of the two ones that I planted, so I'm sorry about that. Also, I'm going to dedicate a bed to uh, cut flowers again this year. I have six raised beds. And last year I planted sunflowers in one because the camera operator loves sunflowers. And they are kind of a, 
They need warmer weather to germinate usually. But I was weeding the garlic yesterday and I noticed some sunflower volunteers in the garlic bed because the garlic bed was right next to the last year's sunflower bed. And I'm like, you know, I got a bunch of sunflower seed from years now uh, in seed packets. So I went to the sunflower bed and I put in a couple short rows of some seed that I had. It's like one or two years old. And I thought, you know, it's cold. Yeah, it's cool. But the bed is in good shape. And these other volunteers are already growing. So let's see what happens here. So that's what I did. I just kind of dropped them in. And I'm like, here we go. I mean, it might suck. But then I figured I could just reseed that area in a couple weeks if they don't pop up, you know. The other thing I've got going on is, uh, uh, man, a bunch of years ago, I planted some hops in the closest thing we have to an ornamental bed. Um, it's kind of like a perennial wildflower bed that gets overrun with stuff. And I put some hops in there, and they never did very well. And I think it's because the soil there is kind of dodgy. It's a, There's a lot of clay and not a lot of nutrients there. Wildflowers tend to do really well in that kind of thing, actually. And I brought these... Uh, hops into uh, Brooklyn. I brought them down to Brooklyn and I just kind of dropped them into the backyard and they're taken off. They're like three feet tall already. But the problem, the problem for me, because I'd like to use them in beer brewing, is I don't remember the variety of them. Uh, and I'm wondering if there's a way to figure that out. Is there a, a way to identify, are they Williamette hops? Are they, there's one called golden something. But there's boiling hops and there's finishing hops. When you have a wart of beer, you've got the sugars that you've extracted from your malt and you're boiling that. Some hops you throw in at the beginning of that boil for a certain kind of flavor. And then some hops you put in when the boil is over. Those are called finishing hops and they will give a different flavor. Um... Like Anchor Steam has a kind of, what does it, Anchor Steam? I'm messing up kind of beer. We just had a hoppy beer last night. and We have an India Pale Ale, sorry. And um, that is a hoppy beer. Actually, there's a lot of hops in them because hops is considered a preservative. And they used to, the British used to shoot, ship India Pale Ales to India and the hops would keep the beer viable on the long ship transfer to India so that the British... And India can have it. But I digress here. Um, do you guys know, is there a way to identify hops? I would be curious to know about that. I don't know. Something cool. We'll have to look it up. Other thing to think about with hops, they are ornamental and they have a, it looks like a green pine cone. And that is the hop that you put into the beer. But what's also, the way they mostly harvest them is a trellis that is collapsible or you can drop down. So... And these things will grow to like 16 feet high. So I'm kind of curious about this. I've seen some pictures in Edible Brooklyn where people have grown hops on the laundry tower, the laundry pole in the back here. Um, my yard does not have one anymore, but it used to be back in the day, there was a wood pole that was in the backyard and connected to all the fire escapes coming out the back of a building and everyone would line dry their clothing. Those were replaced by metal laundry poles which my neighbor Brian, my buddy Brian has. Um, and he does dry his laundry on that, which is very cool. So the idea is I've seen where they, people are growing hops up those with strings that you can then let loose and drop back down and harvest the hops instead of having to climb up this kind of 100-year-old laundry pole that might fall over. So my challenge was to build a pole trellis, you know, kind of like a one pole going up and then one at a 90 and have it on some sort of a screw eye that could drop back down like a, a string on a pulley or something. But I was trying to make it look nice. And my neighbors who we share the fence with where I'm going to put this, he is a botanist. Um, and I was talking to him about this. I said, you know, I want it to look nice. And he said, any trellis looks nice when it has plants growing on it. And I was like, oh, Okay, so I'm no longer sweating what the trellis is going to look like. It might suck, but 
it'll look really cool when it has green stuff on it, you know, and it'll be hops. And I'd be curious. I wonder if you could put hops in like foods and stuff. I don't know. I'm wondering about that. There you go. So I think that's it for today's show. Um, I just thought, you know, I feel like talking and I turned on the microphone and made a couple notes and just went with it. And that's kind of what Garden Fork's all about. I'd be curious to uh, hear what you thought about our little reading in the front. Did you enjoy that kind of thing? Radio at GardenFork.tv. Oh, one more brain dump here. Um, I'm changing up the Garden Fork email list and I'm going to put out two emails a week. And I kind of had this epiphany that there's a really there's a ton of really interesting stuff, or at least what I think is interesting stuff on the Garden Fork site. I've been building the site for eight years now. Is it six, eight years? There's over a thousand posts on the site. Some of them are kind of eh, but some of them are kind of fun. There's a whole series on beekeeping, by the way. Um, I'm going to mangle the title, but it's called, oh, Notes from a Beginning Beekeeper by my friend Dave. I think it's 18 posts in general. And he wrote about his first year of beekeeping. It's all on the site. Um, and I'll link to it in here. Maybe I should send an email just about that. But um, long story short, for the geek of you all, um, it, there's going to be a RSS feed email, which I can build in MailChimp. Oh, that's a whole other story. Um, it took me a day and a half to make the thing look nice. Uh, RSS is kind of a clunky feed. It's a text-based feed. So that will go out and kind of tell people what new posts are on the site and what you may have missed from last week. And then I'm also going to put out my regular kind of update video where I talk about the new videos that have gone onto YouTube and other interesting stuff. So I think in that one, I'll highlight some older posts that people might find interesting or relevant to a particular time of year, like barbecue season is coming up, you know, um, coleslaw, cardboard smokers, that kind of thing. My neighbor uh, just gave me a bunch of trout and I'm thinking about smoking it. And then I thought, why not build another version of the cardboard smoker? It's brilliantly simple. Uh, Alton Brown, I don't know if he invented it, but he sure popularized it. And of course, we have a video about it. But then I was thinking about kind of a more vertical fish smoker that you could build out of a cardboard box. You know, get like a wardrobe box. Um, anyway, you, uh, my mind is thinking. So your mind is thinking too, right? What kind of smokers can we make? So there you go. All right. Thanks again for listening. Uh, so your first time, please consider subscribing. Videos come out. I mean... The podcast comes out usually once a week. Every once in a while, we miss a week because Eric sucks at scheduling. <laughs> all right. So make it a great day. Love to hear from you all. And uh, there you go. Enjoy your day. Garden Fork's theme music is licensed from uniquetracks.com. Mm-hmm.